Welcome to the Warbird Mistress. This is Claire, and this is a shorty. Now, today being the 7th of May, everybody's going to think about a video on Coral Sea. But there are a lot of videos on Coral Sea out there. And instead, I'm going to be talking about the Kamakawamaru. The Kamakawamaru was originally a cargo ship built in 1936 for the Osaka Mercantile Steamship Company. Now, it was designed to go on the Japan-New York route. Uh, they were built by the Kawasaki Line, and they were actually one of the faster cargo ships there and had a tremendous capacity. So what does this have to do with Coral Sea? Well, they were commissioned into the Japanese Navy starting in 1937. There were five of them, including the lead ship, which is the topic of this video, which is the Kamikawamaru. There were also the Kiyokawaramaru, the Kimikawamaru, the Kunikawamaru, and the Hirokawamaru. The ships were also converted not just into naval service, but as seaplane tenders. Now, when we think of World War II, we think of big aircraft carriers, escort carriers, light carriers, everything from the Bogue to Illustrious to the Enterprise, now, while all of these are great and important ships, there's a whole other class of aircraft-bearing vessels out there, and these are seaplane tenders. Japan had used them in uh, the early part of the century as one of the first powers to really grasp air power at sea. Other nations had used them really up until the end of World War II. Now the United States had them, Japan had them. Germany had, even between the wars, Germany used them for postal aircraft, and I am working on my video on Luftwaffe at sea that shows all of the maritime armaments of the Luftwaffe, so you'll see that then. Um, everything is getting back on track, just in case you're there, and this is a good time to mention that if you're not a subscriber, hit the bell for notifications, subscribe, you can even join the channel for 99 cents, because there is a lot of new stuff coming out soon. Now, what makes the Kamikawamaru special is that she played an important role in what you can call the preliminary steps in the Solomon's campaign. Now, during Operation M.O., or up the invasion of Fort Moresby that never happened, she played a pretty critical little role, but not one that stands out, not one that you know, made her uh, m one of the more important names in the war. So let's begin by basically describing her. She displaced about 6,800 tons. She was 145 meters long. She had a complement of about 100 as a seaplane carrier, and she was armed with 220 millimeter uh, AA guns to 7.7 millimeter machine guns. She could carry 14 aircraft on, in general. She had catapults. Uh, she was completely outfitted, so she didn't have to crane the aircraft down and up again. I'm not sure about her top speed, but I'm going to garner it somewhere between uh, 12 and 18 knots. That's about average for a, a loaded cargo ship of that type made in Japan in the 1930s. By May of 1942, her complement included 14 aircraft, mostly IEG Type-0 E-13A1 Jakes, and also Mitsubishi F-1M2 Peets. Her tail code on her aircraft is zi dash numbers. If you ever see a picture with Z and I as the beginning two figures on the tail code, that's from the Kamakawamaru. Now on the 2nd of May 1942, she had been dispatched to cover the landings on Santa Isabel. So this is her first step in the Solomon's campaign. And the next day, when she was moored at Arakata Bay, the Kiyokawamaru, which was undergoing repairs, had sent their air unit to be based aboard Kamikawamaru. So they provided the air cover over Tulagi and Guadalcanal in what was known as Cover Force. This was a small subtask force, what in American service might be called a taffy, and it consisted of two light cruisers, Kamikawamaru, three gunboats, and was under the command of Rear Admiral Kuninori Marumo. Now, once Tulagi was secured, even though, as I discussed in my Walk Through the War series, the Japanese did take some losses uh, due to American carrier aircraft interfering, she departed covering group and cover force, those were the two uh, Japanese taffies there, and repositioned herself uh, for the invasion of Port Moresby. Now, as far as it, ways it might seem on a map or in the mind's eye, this isn't really a big hop. So just the very next night, uh, she was 100 miles south of Guadalcanal, and by then the Japanese had already swung into full. They were beginning construction of a seaplane base at Tulagi. Meanwhile, uh, Admiral Fletcher's Task Force 17 
uh, it hears that transports are disembarking troops and equipment at Tulagi. So you have the first strike by the Yorktown. At 1701 hours on the 4th, the first strike of 18 Grumman Wildcats, those are still the Dash 3s, 12 Devastators, and 28 Dauntlesses, all strike the ships and shore installations at Tulagi and Gavutu. They sink the Kikuzuki, uh, the minesweeper Tamamaru, and the auxiliary minesweepers Wa 1 and Wa 2, as well as four barges. The damage is done to the Yuzuki, uh, the destroyer, the mine layer Okinoshima, and the transports Azumasan Maru and Kozui Maru. All for just three planes. So even though they're providing air cover, they don't really have the fighter air cover that they need. The roof was not really an aircraft that was sent on these seaplane tenders, as far as I could tell, at all. But if they did, then it's an exception that didn't make it to the books. The Yorktown's Air Group 5 also was responsible for downing uh, two of the Yokohama Naval Air Group's E-8 and 2 Daves, which were based out of Tulagi and three peat float planes that were shot down all by a VF-42. And these were aircraft that were being sent from Shortland to reinforce the seaplanes in Tulagi Harbor. So the Japanese would do this. They'd establish little seaplane bases at all these little islands, and they'd have recon, anti-sub, and even fighter patrol duties. The peat itself was used as a fighter patrol aircraft at times, and it was actually very capable of doing it, although the roof and the wrecks would be their dedicated float plane fighters. So after that busy day, for all this, the Yorktown loses two Wildcats and a TBD. We go into the 5th of May, 1942. In Rakata Bay, Kiyokawa Maru's air unit had, you know, then filled in for Kamikawa's aircraft losses, and Kamikawa Maru departs for Des Moines Island in the Louisiade. And on the 6th of May, she arrives, and she's detached from Cruiser Division 18 so she can perform reconnaissance duties in preparation for the invasion of Port Moresby. And this brings us to the topic of today. On the 7th of May, 1942, flying out of the harbor outside Des Moines Island, at 0630 hours, she launches her float planes on an air search in, in the typical Japanese fan fashion of one plane every so many degrees to create an arc of you know, an eye in the sky. And just under two hours later at 0820, one of them spots an enemy cruiser fleet 150 miles south-southwest of Des Moines. Now, that's going to be the American cruisers, uh, and it's, you know, one, basically the first sighting that's going to lead to the Battle of Coral Sea. The Japanese know that there's a carrier there. You know, they took these losses at Tulagi. They've encountered American carrier planes. They know that the Yorktown is there. They don't know it's the Yorktown, but they know that something is there. Now, Kamikawa Muru's float planes have spotted Allied shipping. So it's a cruiser force It's obviously... You know, one of the taffies that's a screening force. I'm not sure which one because the the diaries don't quite line up. So whatever it's sighted, it's sighted. They knew there's a surface fleet there. They know that there's a carrier there. And something big is about to happen. The Japanese, of course, have sent you know their fleet carriers down there. They have the Shokaku and the Zuikaku. They've definitely tried to prepare for a major invasion that included air, land, and sea elements. And here we have this cargo ship that was converted as a seaplane tender, and it makes the first spot. So in the air war, we always think about the big carriers, and you know, even if we look at Midway, we know that the reconnaissance plane from the Tone was the one that was late uh, taking off. We know that it spotted the American carrier force. So even there, we see the usefulness of these little float plane reconnaissance aircraft. And the seaplane tender, whether it's going to be Kamikawa Maru or her sister ships, or if it's going to be the Shitoza or the Nisin or any of these, these are important parts of the Japanese air assets in the Pacific. And you might think that, well, it's, you know, they, they can't really be that important. All right, maybe artillery spotting, anti-sub. Um, ironically, Kamikawa Maru was torpedoed by a submarine, the Wahoo. Um, she was then torpedoed again and sunk later by the USS Scamp um, outside of New Ireland. So, and that was only between May 4th and May 29th. So maybe I shouldn't have said anti-submarine there. But the point is, is that these the Japanese were very good at understanding the scope of the war. The Americans had the Kingfisher and you know, there wasn't really a whole lot of idea of what to do with a catapult launch float plane. But on the Japanese side, they had these little harbor units, they had these 
adapted cargo ships that could launch, you know, 14 aircraft is not a small complement. I mean, something you have light carriers that can barely put up that complement in the Japanese fleet. Some of the early Allied escort carriers barely carry that. And the Pete, the Dave, the Roof, the Rex, these, these aren't, you know, jokes. You think of a Zero having this giant float on the bottom, but it was actually a very capable fighter, especially in the early years of the war. And, you know, the Rex later became the George. So, you know, these are not throwaway aircraft. And since there are so many videos on Coral Sea and so much focus on you know, the major elements of it, I thought that this was going to be a nice little short video for Kamakawamaru, maybe one of the unsung players. And you know that on this channel I try to avoid the, the major combat stuff. You know, I really, I don't want to be doing a million videos on the Mustang. I don't want to be doing a ton of videos on, you know, what's a hurricane, what's a typhoon. I like the obscure. And I think that she definitely fits the bill. So I hope you enjoyed this video on Kamakawamaru and Japanese float planes and their role in the Battle of Coral Sea. Uh, personally, I'd love to see a movie made on Coral Sea. You know, you always hear Midway. and We've got, I don't want to say one and a half movies made on that one. Uh, we've got uh, Japanese films like um, Admiral and I think there was one in the 70s just called Yamamoto. But, you know, we really forget about these little ships and if you're a war gamer you might know how important they are me played miniatures for years uh great naval battles i still play uh the third the rest are disastrous bugs and all included but but i've always found a use for these half carriers these seaplane tenders and that's really part of what made the diversity of military aviation back then so interesting was all these things that after the war we just never really saw again so I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to subscribe, hit for updates. Of course, check out the store for merchandise. And you can also join the YouTube channel. Uh, you get free mailings from me. Uh, it's only a dollar a month for the lowest level. At the highest level, well, then I'm going to do a live chat. Now I have one member that meets that uh, level right now, but when it gets to be a few, it'll be definitely interesting. And of course, check us out on Facebook. But until the next time, this is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Take care.